Hello there and welcome once again to The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers. We're here every week meeting interesting people and dealing with topical issues. And today, an issue that I think everyone's going to care about. Well, indeed, uh, veterans' suicide is a very mm -hmm. somber topic, but it's one that needs to be approached and not, not ignored because it is a difficult subject to talk about. We've got a real expert coming uh, to us today, uh, Aaron Ashcroft, Ashworth, excuse me, Ashworth. Uh, is going to be talking to us uh, about veteran suicide. He is with the Oklahoma Department of Veterans Affairs. Good to see us working proactively on this issue. Indeed. We'll have it today on The Verdict. We'll be right back. Right now, Six feet can feel like a long ways away, but from six feet, we can still smile at each other. From our doorways and our stairways, from opposite sides of the street and opposite sides of the country, through fear and frustrations, we can remind each other that we are still here for each other because we can still smile at each other and we're not going anywhere. Military service ran in my blood, starting from my father, which joined the Navy, on the Chickasaw side, my uncle, which served in the United States Army. I'm Benjamin Espinosa, Chief Petty Officer, United States Navy, and I'm Chickasaw. I went to the Secretary of Defense's staff at the Pentagon in Washington, D.C., which ultimately led to becoming a combat support technician for Naval Special Warfare, specifically SEAL Team 10. I think to be proud and to love your tribe, to love being Chickasaw, you also have to love being American. You also have to love everything that America stands for. Equality, perseverance, professionalism, and power. I want my family to know that their father is a good person, but also feels that he has an obligation to the country and to love this nation. Anything worth having is worth dying for. The military and the country owes me nothing. I owe it everything. See more stories about the Chickasaw people at profilesofanation.com. Welcome back to the set of The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers. Kent's going to introduce our guest. Today we're really pleased to have join us Aaron Ashworth, <clears throat> the Oklahoma Department of Veterans <clears throat> excuse me, Affairs. Uh, Aaron uh, did his undergraduate work and his master's degree work at Oral Roberts University and just recently uh, finished a term on the uh, advisory board there. Uh, he <clears throat> is the administrator of mental health and suicide prevention programs for the Oklahoma Department of Veterans Affairs to be distinguished from the uh, federal U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. This is the Oklahoma Department of Veterans Affairs. He's a licensed professional counselor. He's an Army chaplain. Uh, he uh, served uh, three combat tours, uh, two in uh, Iraq and one in Afghanistan with the Oklahoma National Guard. He's a captain in the National Guard as well as being a chaplain, uh, that's his duty in the National Guard. He has 20 years of service, and he's been uh, kind enough to give us some time today to talk about this suicide prevention program that he's deeply involved in. Aaron, really glad to have you. Thanks, Mick. Thanks, Ken, for having me today. It's awesome. Yeah, first, thanks for your service to our country. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. What is the uh, governor's challenge to prevent suicide amongst veterans? So the Oklahoma governor's challenge was a, initially it started as a SAMHSA effort, so that's the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. It's a federal level organization that did grassroots study on veteran suicide across the, across the nation. And they came back looking at kind of hot points around the country, and they asked uh, Mayor Holt and Mayor Bynum, uh, for Tulsa and Oklahoma City if they'd be willing to do what at the time was called a marriage challenge. And that was basically challenging the, the state, uh, those city leaders to be able to pull together a public health approach with a collaborative effort um, amongst different subject matter experts in their, in their cities, and then to do a, a review of the city and then start moving towards an action plan that could reduce suicide for service members, veterans, and their families. How's it going so far? So it's going extremely well. So we started with Tulsa and Oklahoma City, and then uh, as soon as Governor Stitt came into office, 
they offered the uh, the state the governor's challenge. So we had the two mayor's challenges and now the governor's challenge. And uh, we've been working both at the federal level and the state level and at the municipality levels to be able to start pulling this collaboration together, building the team, putting an action plan in place, and then making sure that those action steps are actually getting executed across the state. Why is it that veterans are experiencing a higher suicide rates than the general population? There's a lot of varying factors that go into it. A lot of times when you look at somebody that has high, uh, high validity for um, crisis and trauma, um, veterans kind of stand out uh, amongst the rest. Um, what you see a lot of times are those veterans that have gone overseas, they experience post-traumatic stress due to uh, their experiences. You have some that never even went overseas that might have uh, experienced post-traumatic stress for mil military sexual trauma or different events or different things that they've been involved in within the, their units. Um, so what you see is basically a higher, uh, higher likelihood of crisis and in, in trauma that they're around, um, which leads us to a higher rate of veteran suicide. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of that also has to do with uh, the fact that, uh, uh, you know, m military guys are tough. Um, so if you're a, a guy or a gal that's in the military, like, you're tough. Like, you, you mm -hmm. have a little bit more difficult time reaching out for help, which is what we're trying to combat. What is the official process for leaving the military? Is there an, an exit interview? Are there, are there markers that, that people are looking for as a person reenters society? Yeah, so as you exit out of the military, it depends on your branch. Every branch does things a little bit differently. Um, so the Army, which is what I'm more familiar with, has the TAPS program at the active duty level. At the Guard level, we have a program that's called Crossroads. It introduces uh, that service member to what different kind of programs and different benefits that they might be available to them um, as they're transitioning out. Uh, but then when they get out into the community, there's no going back. So you don't, like, if you didn't write it down at that, mo that moment, uh, then... You may not, or you may not have the information that you need to be able to to reach out to those individuals or those programs. Uh, so that's one thing that we started working towards with the governor's challenge, with making sure that there's on the back end, once they're in the civilian community, uh, a way to reach out and to be able to connect to those services. And we're working on a program that's called Oklahoma Step, which is kind of a, a different program outside of the governor's challenge, but it's one that the governor's challenge is a part of for that transition process. Uh, what is the suicide rate uh, among veterans as compared to the general population? Uh, so every state differs a little bit. Oklahoma, we have about a mean average of 115 uh, suicides for veterans a year, um, which is a little bit higher than some of the other states. Um, that fluctuates year to year. We, uh, you know, with two, 2019 and 2020 kind of being during COVID, everyone kind of was wondering what was going to happen with the rates, but the rates actually dropped um, pretty considerably during the COVID period. Mm. Um, so we're kind of looking at, was that uh, due to just everyone having to come together and being back in their house and being around family and less likelihood to be alone, uh, but then you see an increase in things like domestic violence and stuff like that as well. So it's kind of, uh, as we looked at the, the situation that COVID kind of provided for veterans, it was unique to almost individual cases um, but we're, we're expecting with the different challenges and the things that we're looking at for those rates to continue to decrease, which we're hoping for. What resources are available? So there are, that's the one thing Oklahoma doesn't lack on. Um, <laughs> if I think, if I could sell anything on the state of Oklahoma, Oklahoma does not lack on veteran services. Um, you might have a, individuals that have tried to reach out that would disagree with that. Uh, I think a lot of it is about knowing where to go and who, how to get connected to those different services. Um, but the one thing that I've done over the last couple of years in this position with the Oklahoma Department of Veterans Affairs is kind of scout out across the state, like what programs are uh, in the different regions and different cities, municipalities across the state, and how easy are they to access. Um, so every city in Oklahoma pretty much has some form of veteran service or veteran kind of service organization, whether that be American Legion or VFW or, or some kind of organization that they could reach back to get help and, and find programs in their area. Uh, what we recently have done, though, is we cataloged all that. So one of the first things in, in our research that we were looking at is we kept hearing people say, you know, we don't know where to go. We don't know who to contact. We don't know how to get a hold of such and such service. Um, so during the COVID period, um, ODVA as well as the Community Service Council of Tulsa teamed up, and we worked on what we now call OK Valor. So it's a global information mm -hmm. mapping system that you can go on to, whether you're at home or whether you're at the library or whether you're, you have a phone in your pocket, you can go to this mapping system and type in your location and it gives you every veteran resource 
in service, um, whether it be housing, homelessness, food, uh, needing parenting, re uh, respite care, you name it, we've pretty much identified as many resources as we possibly can. We keep adding to it daily. So it gives uh, that avenue for that veteran who didn't know who, how to get contact, how to contact somebody or who to contact. Now they can do it just right off their phone. Let's explore a little bit your personal experience. <clears throat> you had three uh, combat tours, uh, two in Iraq, one in Afghanistan, and the first, first one was also in Kuwait. Um, <clears throat> Were you a chaplain at the time on all three of those tours? I was not. I've actually, uh, the first tour, I was ground logistics, ground air logistics, and uh, worked more in the supply chain side of the house. Uh, moved over to air traffic control um, in between those two tours, so I came back and crash course in the air traffic control course and went straight back to Iraq. So I spent from 2003 to 2006, um, the first part of that war, or on the initial push, logistics, the second part being air traffic control. And then when I left again into Afghanistan in 2010, I was still air traffic control. What is the uh, role of a chaplain in, an, in a <clears throat> National Guard unit uh, such as you uh, hold right now to look for uh, soldiers that might be in, at risk on suicide prevention? I think the chaplain's <clears throat> role is pretty multi uh, multifaceted. Um, first and foremost, we're there to um, to really kind of support the First Amendment of just allowing soldiers to be able to express their faith and religion and however um, that would benefit them as long as it doesn't impact the mission. So we're there to be able to provide and to uh, perform uh, for the religion and faith that we represent. So we all have to have particular denominational backings um, to be a chaplain, but we basically are there for them to be able to have, have that religious support. Um, we also are there kind of as the the spiritual guidance and counselor for those that are struggling with life issues and mental health issues and whatever they need to come to us for. So we're there to really just kind of be a, a listening ear and then a voice back to the command on how we can best take care of soldiers. Let me jump in and get us to our first break. Aaron Ashworth is our guest. We're discussing suicide prevention amongst veterans. You're watching The Verdict, and we'll be right back. Here office at the University of Central Oklahoma, it is a one-stop shop for veterans when they're trying to get their education. I call it my encore job. I get to take care of veterans. We help them transition. I was that guy that transitioned after 24 years, and in the end, GI Bill is a benefit that those soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marine earned. It was the thing that made us the greatest country in the world coming out of World War II, and it will continue to do the same thing for this future generation of service members. OU Law has a history and heritage that are unparalleled. At the University of Oklahoma College of Law, we empower our students to pursue the career of their dreams. We have the highest U.S. news ranking ever achieved by an Oklahoma law school. We are the first law school in the country to launch a college-wide digital initiative. And this year, our competition teams rank number two in the nation. OU Law, generations of excellence, limitless possibilities. Welcome back to The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers and our guest, Aaron Ashworth, who's discussing veterans and suicide prevention. Uh, Aaron, uh, tell us a little more, if you will, and more specifically about the resources available through the De Oklahoma Department of Veterans Affairs that may benefit veterans. Yeah, so I think when you talk anything mental health, uh, that you first have to really kind of look at not just what's the, the presenting problem, but what got you to that problem in the first place? So a lot of time what we see when we're talking um, why people are to the breaking point is a lot of times because um, they've had a hard time finding a job or they've had a, a rocky relationship or they've just had some experiences that have kind of led to either bad decisions or just things going wrong in their life that kind of led them to that point. So if we really want to tackle mental health, the goal is to how do we start to build in uh, what we call basically kind of um, protective factors or life protective factors that allow people uh, to not get there in the first place. Uh, so a lot of the services that we've been focused on with ODVA is kind of in that social circle. Um, so ODVA, we run 
uh, the veteran centers, which are uh, for the, uh, the long-term residential care facilities for, uh, for veterans. Um, so that's one of our main things that we run. Uh, we do claims and benefits for the federal VA. Um, so if you have a claim that you want to file, but some of the other programs are more in that social service. So we have a women's veteran outreach, we have an education department, we have an employment department. If you're transitioning and you want to start your own business, so if you're transitioning out of the military and you're interested in starting your own business, we have programs that are set up to move you into entrepreneurship. Um, so it's really about trying to be that life protective factor piece on the front end so you don't ever get to the point that you're in, in a place where you're having a, a breakdown and having to find those things last minute, but then being there as that support system if you do find yourself in that place. Let me ask you another question. Uh, is there any significant statistical difference between the suicide rate, in, I'm talking about in Oklahoma, yeah. of uh, uh, women that have been in the military versus men that have been in the military? No, you see, um, there's a lower rate, but I think a lot of times that lower rate uh, for women is kind of really representative in that there's a lower population number um, as of this point. So uh, in that, the, the rates still kind of run right after one another. What you see yeah. a lot of times with uh, the women rates is um, a lot of times they've been exposed to military sexual trauma where maybe a male hasn't, um, which has led to um, um, whatever crisis or trauma event that they're experiencing at that time. Um, not to say that they don't have, I mean, they're, they're going to come back from war just like everybody else does, um, having to work through the things that they saw and experienced while they were there. Uh, so, but there, what we saw, I think, initially when we started the Governor's Challenge and Marriage Challenge is that there weren't a lot of services that were provided specifically to women's needs. And what you're seeing now over the last two years is really an increase in those services being provided that are very specific to uh, a woman veteran and a woman service member versus a male. Um, so that's very unique and something I'm excited to see continue to grow. How are other states uh, working on these same solutions? Are there similar programs going on across the country? So luckily, yeah, the, uh, the Governor's Challenge is actually a national program. So like I said before, SAMHSA, um, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, uh, pretty much reached out to every state in the union and asked if their governors would be willing to uh, take on this effort. So there's a good portion of, uh, of the, uh, the country that is we work together in collaboration even at the national level talking state to state like well, okay what are your guys what are your projects what are your pilot programs what are you focusing on uh, but what you see in the veteran space is that we're really good about doing that as well because um, both the federal VA and state level military departments they're really good about sharing back and forth and kind of saying all right what are what's working mm -hmm. in your area that we might be able to to tweak and work in our area so there's a lot of collaboration going on, specifically um, right now, um, go, dating back to about 2017 mm -hmm. up to today, where you see a lot of cross-state cl collaborations and efforts moving forward. There's a lot of veteran service programs out there. Are there areas that you feel are underfunded that we should be concentrating on more heavily? I do. I think housing, and uh, housing is a big one. Um, and I think that with uh, in Oklahoma, uh, the weather alone, uh, is a good good reason to have housing programs. And so what we saw a lot during COVID, so I'll just kind of paint a picture for you, is so say that you have a student that's uh, a military veteran that's in going to school, pick your university, um, and then COVID happens. Um, well, that, well their, their family and their friends and whoever, their, their place of residence might be out of state. Um, so when COVID happens, they get kicked out of their dorms and the school shut down. Well, where do those kids go? Because uh, now, that service member and that veteran is in the state of Oklahoma, serving in the state of Oklahoma a lot of times, and uh, may not have the ability to go home. Um, so there's a little bit of a short-term housing crisis. And last year, like we had a, um, the ice storms that took out a lot of uh, residential electricity and homes across the state. And what you'll see is uh, a lot of, we had an incident where there was a veteran and his wife, um, older in age, that were on particular medical care, medical devices in their home, um, but they were in a part of the, the state that didn't have electricity for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. Well, they don't, they don't necessarily qualify for any of the homeless grants or um, the SSVF grants because they own their own house. Um, so it's those short-term kind of programs that are really needed in the state of Oklahoma right now for housing, um, just those kind of one-off incidents that tend to happen a lot in service members' lives. I've done some work on veterans' homelessness, and it was amazing to me how many veterans don't apply for or may not be aware of all of the programs that are available. Right. That is very much a big issue, and I think that's where we're still, in Valor was kind of our first step to 
uh, moving towards how do we get the word out? Like how, how do we make what I, what I call basically um, pathways of care or, or like how do I ease that pathway for you to be able to find those services when, when you're in need? Our, you talked about the governor's challenge. Uh, are law enforcement and the local clergy involved in those? They are. Uh, so with the, both when we started the Tulsa and Oklahoma City Mayor's Challenge, and now we have a lot in Mayor's Challenge as well, um, part of that team that we build in that collaboration is making sure that law enforcement, first responders, um, clinicians, and all those sorts are, are kind of a part of that team to be able to speak into. So we work a lot with the different police departments in, uh, across the state. Um, we, they train us, we train them <laughs> on uh, like, uh, what we call ASSIST, which is Applied Suicide Intervention Skills Training. Um, they'll work with us on kind of this is how we approach things, what are some best approaches and best practices that we can pick up. Um, so there's a lot of uh, law enforcement represent, representation on those Mayor's Challenge teams across the state. If one of our viewers um, knows a veteran and is concerned about them, what should they do? I would say just have the courage to connect. Uh, so we started this media campaign um, earlier this year, and uh, it really is – I want – everybody that's a caretaker to have the courage to connect. I want the community to have courage to connect, and I want that veteran to have courage to connect. Be willing to connect to that individual that you know is struggling, and then lead them in, and help them find the courage to be able to connect themselves to whatever service they need. And a lot of the times we get so, um, so scared or, and so fearful that, do I really want to step into this? Do I want to invite drama into my life? Or whatever the reason may be. And a lot of times people are reluctant to be able to move towards somebody that needs help. And what we really need to do is to have open, honest conversations, not be afraid of the stigma, be able to step into it and say, hey, what do you need? I'm here with you. Let me walk this out. Like, veterans are, like, you're trained from the very moment that you join the military uh, to be in the trenches with your battle buddy. Uh, so mm -hmm. it should be no different when we come back from civilian life. Like, we have, excuse me, great organization, organizations across the state. Um, like Eagle Ops in Tulsa that's really good about bringing social connection together and saying, hey, be there for somebody in need. If you see a battle buddy in need, if you see a veteran in need, make sure they're getting connected to that. Other, so, other service members as well as the different community services that are available to them. So just be, have the courage to connect, and that would be where I would start. How do you screen uh, for suicidal risk among veterans? See, that, that takes you back into kind of the clinical realm. So. I think when we talk about screeners, um, what you'll see is in mental health practice, you'll see what's called PHQ-9 or the GAD-7, which are depression and anxiety screeners. Um, we have the Columbia Scale, uh, which is a really well-known suicide assessment that uh, a lot of healthcare and mental health care clinicians use. And uh, I prefer myself to use the Columbia Scale. I think it gives you a more avid picture of whether someone's moving towards a state of uh, suicidal ideations or moving away from it. Uh, but there's a lot of different assessments, and those are probably the main three that were that are used are um, the GAD-7, the, the PHQ-9, and then the Columbia scale. Is the, the suicide rate higher or lower amongst active service members as opposed to veterans? Uh, what you'll see is it's pretty on par. Uh, I don't think there's a huge distinguish um, between active duty, National Guard, reserves, as well as um, kind of a, along the lines of whether you've gone overseas and whether you've actually not gone overseas. So there's quite a few service members um, that have been in the military their whole entire career and never had to go on a deployment. And it's kind of shocking that uh, after this 20-year war now that you would be like, how are you, in current times, how'd you, how'd you miss out on a deployment? But a lot of times, missing out on a deployment can be somewhat of a crisis or traumatic to that individual soldier. Um, but I think that you don't see huge variance, but there are different risk factors and stuff that would be in play for somebody that had gone overseas and been on a deployment and fought in a war versus someone that hadn't. Mm -hmm. I think we're out of All time, right. Mick. Hey, uh, Aaron, thanks so much for coming on and discussing mm -hmm. such an important topic with us. Thank yeah, you Appreciate for it very today. much. All right. We'll be right back. Kent and I'll have a final word after this. It used to be okay in hospitals. It used to be okay in movie theaters. It was okay in classrooms, restaurants, and airplanes. But thanks to a greater understanding of the dangers, that's not okay anymore. So now that we know secondhand smoke causes lifelong health problems, why is it still okay to smoke with children in the car?
Bottom line, it's not okay. Let's get serious about protecting kids. Join the fight at StopsWithMe.com. All children deserve a life of hope and love. But sometimes they experience a life of pain, neglect, and abuse. When that happens, each child deserves all the quality, assistance, and representation that can be offered in our legal system. For more information, call 23CHILD. Oklahoma Lawyers for Children, helping to bring hope and love back to the lives of abused children. You will always be mom and dad to me. We have uh, uh, children come from a different lifestyle, different mindset. You have to open your arms and really do what you have to do to have that child become a part of your family. And if it's more patience, that's what you do. Kids got to know they can trust you. And that's what we've tried to do with these kids. The Journal Record is pleased to be a sponsor of The Verdict. The Journal Record, since 1903, the best source of Oklahoma business news and legal information. Well, suicide amongst veterans is a, an issue that's been going on for generations. I'm so glad we're concentrating on now, and Aaron's work, I think, is a good example. Yes, the focus that uh, uh, many of the regulatory agencies, including the Oklahoma Department of Veterans Affairs, is really worthwhile, and we're very lucky to, that they're doing what they're doing. Let me pass on some website information to you. Uh, you can get more information about Aaron and his crew at ok.gov slash veterans. That's ok.gov slash veterans. And we have a website. You can log on, tell us about a guest you'd like to see or a topic you'd like to see us discuss right here on The Verdict. That website is theverdict.tv. That's going to do it. For Kent, I'm Mick, and we'll see you next week on The Verdict.